to build a fire by jack london for land travel and seafaring the world over a companion is usually considered desirable in the klondike as tom vincent found out such a companion is absolutely essential but he found it out not by precept but through bitter experience never travel alone is a precept of the north he had heard it many times and laughed for he was a strapping young fellow big boned and big muscled with faith in himself and in the strength of his head and hands it was on a bleak january day when the experience came that taught him respect for the frost and for the wisdom of the men who had battled with it he had left calumet camp on the yukon with a light pack on his back to go up paul creek to the divide between it and cherry creek where his party was prospecting and hunting moose the frost was sixty degrees below zero and he had thirty miles of lonely trail to cover but he did not mind in fact he enjoyed it swinging along through the silence his blood pounding warmly through veins and his mind carefree and happy for he and his comrades were certain they had struck pay up there on cherry creek divide and further he was returning to them from dawson with cheery home letters from the states at seven o'clock when he turned his heels of his moccasins towards calumet camp it was still black night and when day broke at half past nine he had made the four mile cut off across the flats and was six miles up paul creek the trail had seen little travel followed the bed of the creek and there was no possibility of his getting lost he had gone to dawson by the way of cherry creek and indian river so paul creek was new and strange by half past eleven he was at the forks which had been described to him and he knew he had covered fifteen miles half the distance he knew that in the nature of things the trail was bound to grow worse from there on and thought that considering the good time he had made he merited lunch casting off his pack and taking a seat on a fallen tree he unmittened his right hand reaching inside his shirt next to the skin and fished out a couple of biscuits sandwiched with sliced bacon and wrapped in a handkerchief the only way they could be carried without freezing solid he had barely chewed the first mouthful when his numbing fingers warned him to put his mitten on again this he did not without surprise at the bitter swiftness with which the frost bit in undoubtedly it was the coldest snap he had ever experienced he thought he spat upon the snow a favorite northland trick and the sharp crackle of the instantly congealed spittle startled him the spirit thermometer at calumet had registered sixty below when he left but he was certain it had grown much colder how much colder he could not imagine half of the first biscuit was yet untouched but he could feel himself beginning to chill a thing most unusual for him this would never do he decided and slipping the pack straps across his shoulders he leaped to his feet and ran briskly up the trail a few minutes of this made him warm again and he settled down to a steady stride munching the biscuits as he went along the moisture that exhaled with his breath crusted his lips and moustache with pendant ice and formed a miniature glacier on his chin now and again sensation forsook his nose and cheeks and he rubbed them till they burned with the returning blood most men wore nose straps his partners did but he had scorned such feminine contraptions until now had never felt the need of them now he did feel the need for he was rubbing constantly nevertheless he was aware of a thrill of joy of exultation he was doing something achieving something mastering the elements once he laughed aloud in sheer strength of life and with his clenched fist defied the frost he was its master what he did he did in spite of it it could not stop him he was going on to cherry creek divide strong as were the elements he was stronger 
At such times, animals crawled away into their holes and remained in hiding. But he did not hide. He was out in it, facing it, fighting it. He was a man, a master of things. In such fashion, rejoicing proudly, he tramped on. After an hour, he rounded a bend where the creek ran close to the mountainside and came upon one of the most insignificant appearing but most formidable dangers in northern travel. The creek itself was frozen solid to its rocky bottom, but from the mountains came the outflow of several springs. These springs never froze, and the only effect of the severest cold snaps was to lessen their discharge. Protected from the frost by the blanket of snow, the water of these springs seeped down into the creek and, on top of the creek ice, formed shallow pools. The surface of these pools, in turn, took on a skin of ice which grew thicker and thicker until the water overran and so formed a second ice-skinned pool above the first. Thus at the bottom was the solid creek ice, then probably six to eight inches of water, then the thin ice skin, then another six inches of water, and another ice skin. And on top of this last skin was about an inch of recent snow to make the trap complete. To Tom Vincent's eye, the unbroken snow surface gave no warning of the lurking danger. As the crust was thicker at the edge, he was well toward the middle before he broke through. In itself, it was a very insignificant mishap. A man does not drown in 12 inches of water. But in its consequences, as serious an accident as could possibly befall him. At the instant he broke through, he felt cold water strike his feet and ankles. And with half a dozen lunges, he made it to the bank. He was quite cool and collected. The thing to do, and the only thing to do, was to build a fire. For another precept of the North runs, travel with wet socks down to 20 below zero. After that, build a fire. And it was three times 20 below and colder, and he knew it. He knew, further, that great care must be exercised. That with failure at the first attempt, the chance was made greater for failure at the second attempt. In short, he knew there must be no failure. The moment before, a strong, exulting man, boastful of his mastery of the elements. He was now fighting for his life against those same elements. Such was the difference caused by the injection of a quart of water into a Northland traveler's calculations. In a clump of pines on the rim of the bank, the spring-high water had lodged many twigs in small branches. Thoroughly dried by summer sun, they now waited the match. It is impossible to build a fire with heavy Alaskan mittens on one's hands. So Vincent bared his, gathered a sufficient number of twigs, and knocking the snow from them, knelt down to kindle his fire. From an inside pocket he drew out matches and a strip of thin birch bark. The matches were of the Klondike kind, sulfur matches, one hundred in a bunch. He noticed how quickly his fingers had chilled as he separated one match from the bunch and scratched it on his trousers. The birch bark, like the driest of paper, burst into bright flame. This he carefully fed with the smallest twigs and finest debris, cherishing the flame with the utmost care. It did not do to hurry things, as he well knew, and although his fingers were now quite stiff, he did not hurry. After the first quick, biting sensation of cold, his feet had ached with a heavy, dull ache and were rapidly growing numb. But the fire, although a very young one, was now a success. He knew that a little snow, briskly rubbed, would speedily cure his feet. But at the moment he was adding the first twigs to the fire, a grievous thing happened. The pine boughs above his head were burdened with a four-month snowfall, and so finely adjusted were the burdens that his slight movements in collecting the twigs had been sufficient to disturb the balance. The snow from the topmost bough was the first to fall, 
striking and dislodging the snow on the boughs beneath. And all this snow, accumulating as it fell, smote Tom Vincent's head and shoulders and blotted out his fire. He still kept his presence of mind, for he knew how great the danger was. He started at once to rebuild the fire, but his fingers were now so numb that he could not bend them, and he was forced to pick up each twig and splinter between the tips of his fingers of either hand. When he came to the match, he encountered great difficulty in separating one from the bunch. This he succeeded in managing, however, and also, by great effort, in clutching the match between his thumb and forefinger, but in scratching it he dropped it in the snow and could not pick it up again. He stood up, desperately. He could not even feel his weight on his feet, although the ankles were aching painfully. Putting on his mittens, he stepped to one side, so that the snow would not fall upon the new fire he was to build, and beat his hands violently against a tree trunk. This enabled him to separate and strike a second match and to set fire to the remaining fragment of birch bark. But his body had now begun to chill, and he was shivering, so that when he tried to add the first twigs, his hand shook and the tiny flame was quenched. The frost had beaten him. His hands were worthless. But he had had the foresight to drop the bunch of matches into his wide mouth, outside pocket, before he slipped on his mittens in despair and started to run up the trail. One cannot run the frost out of wet feet at sixty below and colder, however, as he quickly discovered. He came round a sharp turn of the creek to where he could look ahead for a mile. But there was no help, no sign of help. Only the white trees and the white hills, and the quiet cold, and the brazen silence. If only he had a comrade whose feet were not freezing, he thought. Only such a comrade to start the fire that could save him. Then his eyes chanced upon another high-water lodgment of twigs and branches. If he could strike a match, all might yet be well. With stiff fingers, which he could not bend, he got out a bunch of matches, but found it impossible to separate them. He sat down awkwardly and shuffled the bunch about his knees until he got it resting on his palm with the sulfur ends projecting somewhat in the manner the blade of a hunting knife would project when clutched in a fist. But his fingers stood straight out. They could not clutch. This he overcame by pressing the wrist on the other hand against them and so forcing them down upon the bunch. Time and again, holding thus by both hands, he scratched the bunch on his leg and finally ignited it. But the flame burned into the flesh of his hand and he involuntarily relaxed his hold. The bunch fell into the snow, and while he tried vainly to pick it up, sizzled and went out. Again he ran, by this time badly frightened. His feet were utterly devoid of sensation. He stubbed his toes once on a buried log, but beyond pitching him into the snow and wrenching his back, it gave him no feelings. He recollected being told of a camp of moose hunters somewhere above the forks of Paul Creek. He must be somewhere near, he thought, and if he could find it, yet might be saved. Five minutes later he came upon it, lone and deserted, with drifted snow sprinkled inside the pine bough shelter in which the hunters had slept. He sank down, sobbing. All was over, and in an hour at best, in that terrific temperature, he would be an icy corpse. But the love of life was strong in him, and he sprang again to his feet. He was thinking quickly. What if the matches did burn his hands? Burned hands were better than dead hands. No hands at all were better than death. He floundered along the trail until he came upon another high-water lodgment. There were twigs and branches, leaves and grasses, all dry and waiting the fire. Again he sat down and shuffled the bunch of matches on his knees, got it into place on his palm, with the wrist of his other hand forced the nerveless fingers down against the bunch, and with the wrist kept them there. At the second scratch the bunch caught fire, and he knew that if he could stand the pain he was saved. He choked with the sulfur fumes, and the blue flame licked the flesh of his sands. At first he could not feel it, but it burned quickly, in through the frosted surface. The odor of burning flesh 
his flesh was strong in his nostrils. He writhed about in his torment, yet held on. He set his teeth and swayed back and forth until the clear white flame of the burning match shot up, and he applied that flame to the leaves and grasses. An anxious five minutes followed, but the fire gained steadily. Then he set to work to save himself. Heroic measures were necessary, such was his extremity, and he took them, alternately rubbing his hands with snow and thrusting them into the flames, and now and again beating them against the hard trees. He restored their circulation sufficiently for them to be of use to him. With his hunting knife, he slashed the straps from his pack, unrolled the blanket, and got out dry socks and footgear. Then he cut away his moccasins and bared his feet. But while he had taken liberties with his hands, he kept his feet fairly away from the fire and rubbed them with snow. He rubbed them till his hands grew numb. Then he would cover his feet with the blanket, warm his hands by the fire, and return to the rubbing. For three hours he worked, till the worst effects of the freezing had been counteracted. All the night he stayed by the fire, and it was late the next day when he limped painfully into the camp on the Cherry Creek Divide. In a month's time he was able to be about on his feet, although the toes were destined always after that to be very sensitive to the frost. But the scars on his hands he knows he will carry to the grave, and never travel alone. He now lays down the precept of the North.